It's the KSO Show and the first one this year after a Kansas State Wildcat win. I'm Derek Young, joined by the ever so eloquent Grand Flanders. And of course, Drew Galloway, this is how we will conduct this season. We'll have an instant reaction podcast, you know, as soon as we can after hopefully 12 victories. We got game one. We got I, win I, one <laughs> against Stanford. Uh, Before we get immediate into thoughts. It, uh, yeah, immediate thoughts. How close are we sitting together? Before we even talk about the football Uncomfortably game. close. Yeah, that's that's all like I need to put out there. Apart. That's all we need to put out there. Now talk about the game. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, let's actually get into the big picture and because we already discussed earlier this week, Flando, the yes. implications of what this game would mean for Kansas State. And it was kind of more than a typical season opener would be, you know, important how critical and important it was just because not only is it a power five opponent you have another non-conference game later on in two weeks that is going to pose a great challenge as well perhaps even though they're a group of five school a team that is tougher than stanford and nevada then followed by probably maybe your three toughest big 12 games of the entire season um right out of the gate so if you don't beat stanford unfortunately you 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 kind of leave one and five on the table unfortunately but they got the win over stanford so I mean, you know, it's an important win, obviously, but how important? Uh, It's super important. Yeah, like you said, we already talked about it. And sure enough, they went out and did it. Maybe not in the the fashion that we may have thought. The offense sputtered here and there, but was really solid in other areas, whereas the defense was pretty much solid from start to finish, which we didn't really know if we were going to see that right away out the gate. So, I mean, a lot to unpack in this interesting game that K-State still came out on the top of. Yeah, it's really important. It was a huge win to, number one, get the losing streak that they had from last season out of their mouths and to move on, win this game, and then move on. And you're looking at Southern Illinois next week, Nevada two weeks, and then the three the three probably best teams of the Big 12 right after that. So, like, you have to start off really well. And we learned a lot, but we also saw a lot that was really impressive as well. Yeah, they give themselves a little bit of margin for error. Um, obviously, they don't want to lose Nevada in two weeks, but if they do, it's not the end of the world anymore. Yep. But it still makes it a challenge because of the three first Big 12 games. But, you know, not to look ahead. Southern Illinois is, you know, an FCS school. And, you know, we can look ahead because we're not playing the game. But this probably Absolutely. puts 2-0 in the books, you would hope. You can almost assume, although they, they lose to Arkansas State last year. So yeah. take nothing for granted. But this probably ensures a 2-0 start. And... Depending on what Nevada does with Cal, maybe a top 25 showdown in week three. Probably not. I don't think the Cats are going to be in the top 25. The one thing, and that's this, this game is so interesting because the defense played so well against Stanford, but Stanford also offensively was very, very shaky. Was that because uh, defensively Joe, Joe Klanderman did a great job calling plays? Um, or is it because Stanford wasn't prepared? I think it's a mixture of, of both, honestly, because I don't think the quarterbacks, either quarterback they, they had in mind, um, did what they wanted to do to make it seem like they could go far. But K-State persevered through that. Now it's going to be a question of, is this defense for real? We won't really know that, I don't think, until two weeks from now in Nevada. But Southern Illinois will be a good test for all these other guys that, you know, because it could, it, we're hoping 2-0, and it could be a time you see guys that, Maybe we won't see the rest of the year as well. Of course, you could have led us down the path, but we're going to tackle each side of the ball. Yeah. The first part was about the big picture implications of what this win means. And, and I think it also kind of, you know, before we move on to the offense, I think it also kind of means something good to the public eye, which, you know, the Big 12 has had a black eye on it. Kansas State's kind of had a black eye on it the way that they finished last year. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people that not everyone's going to watch that game start to finish. They're going to kind of look at the box score, look at the score, and say, oh, okay. But you you see Kansas State was up 24 nothing, and then you get maybe almost like a garbage time touchdown at the end by David Shaw's group. Yeah. It might as well be viewed yeah. that because he didn't go for two. And then he kicked an onside kick, was kind of a head scratcher, of course. So he was kind of conceding the game at that point. So, But a lot of people are just going to blindly look at the score, look what Kansas State did, say, hey, they beat State for 24-7. Maybe we should kind of start to take them a little bit seriously. Offensively, you know, let's move on. Let's yeah. talk about each side of the ball. Mm-hmm. Offensively, uh, probably a little bit of an uneven performance. You, know, you score 24 on Stanford. Maybe you kind of think to yourself, hey, that's not bad. But at the end of the day, they probably left at least 10 or 14 other points on yeah. the board. Yeah. Probably could have got 35, maybe 38, maybe 40. Who knows? Uneven performance. I think Skylar Thompson, they said it wasn't going to be rusty. The first half looked rusty. Um, and then the second half, I thought the offensive line probably lost – uh, the momentum that they kind of built up in the first half. The first half, the offensive line controlled the line of scrimmage. The third quarter was by far their worst quarter. 
Uh, it, this, I mean, this kind of goes into how they played all of last season, where the third quarter was a struggle for the offense, and the offensive line couldn't get a push. I mean, it was probably an uneven day for Christian Duffy, and but the re- the rest of the O line was okay. They didn't have that edge that they had to start the game in the third quarter, and then it was kind of an un- uneven performance from Skyler as well. Mm-hmm. Good point on the third quarter. They struggled in the third quarter almost all of last season. I was like, especially in the last half of the season, that's where it's the offense. Messing him stocks. Yeah, the third quarter and and today, unfortunately. I wouldn't say that the offense was bad, bad in the third quarter because it was pretty uneven throughout the day as a whole, but the offensive line probably came apart in the third quarter. The offense, the defense should be thanked for everything from the offense because the defense made it so this wasn't a close game. Stanford was given plenty of chances on offense to convert and keep this game close. 24 points shouldn't be enough against a Power 5 team in like Stanford. Luckily, the defense showed up. The offense Played well enough. Like we said, I think Skyler, I like his confidence. I like that he's not thinking too deeply anymore about the little mistakes he did make here and there. It's a win. He was happy about it in post game. He's still going to know there's room for improvement. He said that as well. But that is one thing. If I'm going to pinpoint a guy's demeanor and how he played, wasn't great. But I do think I like Skyler's mentality more than I've ever seen it. That's fair. And I would say the, the, the big problem I had with Skyler was probably, and, and hopefully maybe he gets more comfortable yeah. being back at the offense. Some of that will go away. But missed a lot of receivers open. Absolutely. Yeah. Took took a sack or two that I didn't like, especially the one where he could have easily went mm-hmm. out of bounds or threw it away. Instead, he stayed in bounds. It was right before halftime yeah. mm-hmm. and took the sack. That was a pretty ugly decision. The choice to throw to Phillip Brooks. Yeah. yeah, there. I mean, and, a yeah they're, they're, and then, the, you know, checking out of the play to Phillip Brooks yeah. for the first interception. Mm-hmm. Not, not Which was an great. incredible catch. Yep. Yeah. But still, yeah. Good play by the secondary guy, but it's still – Still a prop, still a mistake. So Skyler made his mistakes. You got you'd hope to think that as the season wears on, those start to erase, start yeah. to um, disappear, mm-hmm. of course. But and, and then he had he had a crucial drop on a on a, on a down and distance that would have got him the first down from Daniel Matter Bay Bay. Yeah. Joe Irvin didn't never got was able to get going. Uh, mm-hmm. Malik Knowles had you know was wasn't featured very much i don't think he was able to break free a whole lot but the one play that i did like is when he fought for the first down and gained about four extra yards mm-hmm. uh that was pretty significant toward towards glove his yep. thumb came yeah. through and towards glove uh the offensive line was inconsistent i thought um a decent first half uh you know not so much in the second half Philip Brooks was a guy that was probably open as more than anyone today. So if you want to talk about offensive mm-hmm, mm-hmm. MVP, I know you you put Deuce yeah. Vaughn as the MVP, and that makes sense. He was you know he had to do with a lot of the production on mm-hmm. offense, but you know probably close second was Philip Brooks. He started he really started things off because after that tough tough Skyler interception, the defense stopped him again, and that next drive was when Skyler was able to go down and score. But that was set up by Phillip Brooks getting open and really one of the easiest throws Skylar Thompson may make all season. Down, Really long downfield pass, but wide open. So much time. That's when the offensive line was at its peak because so much time to pass. Someone's going to get open. Brooks is good at finding those weak spots, and he made a play. I do agree. He was the receiver to look at because Malik Knowles, like you said, wasn't as... Um, he, I think when he did get the ball in his hands, he looked good, but they right. didn't give it to him all the time. He had the nice yeah. carry, Exactly, too. Yep. that really nice 25-yard carry um, in the first half. So I like what I saw from Malik, but yeah, I would agree Phillip Brooks was probably the the um, most effective receiver today. I think he had the most targets, too. And I think a little bit of that has to do with everybody was focused on Malik. Yeah, Malik had to deal with press coverage most of the game, which led to Brooks and other guys being open. But Brooks was by far the most consistent receiver today, getting open at least. Yeah, and you're going to have to hope for Daniel Matter Bebe to kind of break free mm-hmm. a little bit more. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Not, not drop a ball when he's wide open. Mm-hmm. Um, the nice, He did make a nice catch to make up for that. Not later in that drive. Was it later in that drive, yeah. Was that the second half? Yeah, it was. It was going, on the rollout. Yep. Yeah, on the rollout. Might have been a better catch. throw. That was Skylar Thompson's true. also. He best. found him in a spot he could only throw it to him, yeah. That was Skylar Thompson's best throw of the day. Yeah, the, the offense, they got work to do. Um, and I feel like an idiot because all the all offseason, and we can talk about this too, all offseason. And I'm like, hey, works. hey, the offense is going Never, to be great. Yeah. The defense is a work in progress. And that was exactly the flip was script. It was complete opposite today. Is this similar to last year's going into the game one? Because I feel like it was, but maybe not. Like the defense no, didn't the, do good against Arkansas State, and then the, the offense, offense did the all offense right. Was very so it was good. almost like exact opposites yeah. flipped. But yeah, it's funny how that works. I mean, you'd rather get a W. Exactly. And that's the thing is now against Stanford, you got a W against Power 5 team, and you did it in convincing fashion. I, I, I just think, especially. 
I, I'm going to keep saying it. We'll get to it. We're talking about offense, but defense gets tipped the cat. Yeah, we'll go to that we'll next because these are only going to be 10 or 15 oh, minutes yeah. or instant reaction pots. Defense shut out in the first half, almost the shut out in the second half, of course. Uh, they were, you know, probably played a little bit of a prevent there when, when they scored the touchdown and – they were, they were giving up yards yeah. so they could take more yeah. time off the clock. Mm-hmm. I mean, for all intents and purposes, that probably was a shutout. Yep. I think the biggest – my biggest takeaway, aside from their incredible performance, and you guys can talk about the players that you thought really stood out. We can get into that. But for me, it was just – I was just like, you know, my, my mind was just racing and my head was spinning. Just how many – they were literally taking six, seven guys off the field and subbing like every other play. Yeah. I, I remember the first series, like we're going through – and we're calling out who's on the field and it's like we're looking at we have to look at the roster like we don't have to do that a ton during games but we look at the roster and we're like who is on the field now and like it would be instant in and out in and out in and out i think like 15 or 16 different guys played on the first series Mm -hmm. on the defense i mean as a team they played 57 guys in the first half so that tells you how much this team's rotating and how much how many guys they actually do trust and they maybe they do have the depth that they discussed so much during fall camp I mean, we went the first five plays, and I think I, the most stunned I was we we hadn't even seen Tim Horn yet, uh, which was interesting. He didn't start. Eka Boydoho started, but he only played one play. And then Gardner came in. Gardner was seeing quite a bit of time, maybe a little bit more than I anticipated. Um, the, the the starting defensive line was actually Eli Huggins, Felix Anadike, and Jalen Pickle. And Jalen Pickle. Pickle and, Three down uh, yeah, and then they, yep. and then Ryan Hennington was the third linebacker, I think, on the field along with. Daniel Green, Cody Fletcher. So basically your starting defense actually didn't have Tim Horn or Boom, or Boom Massey or Jerome McPherson or Khalid Duke. So that was interesting just because of alignment. Obviously, Khalid Duke's probably a starter. He's going to get starter yeah. snaps and all yeah. that. But you, I mean, you just, I mean, they're putting a lot of faith and, tr- and trust into a lot of different players at that point. But also interesting, too, is they were still playing fast in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. In the fourth quarter, which is what Joe Klanerman wanted, obviously, and that's why they do rotate so much as long as they can trust guys. They, I mean, that was that was also another takeaway I think I had, and I put it in four downs, of course. If you want to read that, it's on the site right now, premium story. But the team speed, at least on the defensive side, I think you might see it on the offensive side too. It just wasn't able to come to fruition today just because mm-hmm. they couldn't really get it rolling. They had it rolling until Skyler threw that first interception. But, I mean, they looked – like maybe they're not uh, as fast of a team as uh, maybe I should give them credit for, or because uh, at the very least they were playing fast. I think it's funny because this is also in a game where they were playing bigger sets too, which you know bigger bodies instead. But most of the year we'll probably be see more secondary players out there. Echo with with Gardner and Brents at the same time many times throughout the season. You didn't see that a bunch this game. Instead, you saw bigger lineups with Hennington, Wayne Jones, you know, playing the nickel and. Elder, like as a third safety, interesting lineups here and there. I don't, I mean, that's the thing I want to ask you, the smart football guy. Do you see these lineups the rest of the season? Was this special for Stanford? Some of it's special for Stanford. I think the inclusion, maybe like a third linebacker, because that's basically what Ryan Hennington and Wayne Jones mm-hmm. are. I don't think they're going to be asked to play the nickel against teams that really yeah. throw the ball around the yard. So this is a, a, a personnel group and, and an offensive style that is more conducive to their skill sets. Mm-hmm. Maybe Wayne Jones can. He played safety before. But we'll see. But I, and I, I expect that at some point you'll see more Reggie Stubblefield, which yeah. maybe Reggie Stubblefield is the guy at nickel because we didn't see as much Omaris Brown as yeah. I thought we would. Did he play at all? I guess yeah, I didn't play. Yeah, he played a little bit. Little Reggie bit. had a really nice Ross play. Elder, Ross yeah. Elder played a lot. Yeah, he did. Ross Reggie Elder didn't get a lot ball. of time, but he had a really nice play You know, later in the game yeah. where he yeah. knocked the ball away. Elder it. did play a lot. I thought he played fine. Yep. The only guy I had a problem with out there, but he still – didn't get too glaring of uh, mistakes was Ryan Hennington. Yeah, but, I mean, he was probably the one I was cutting no man's land the most. Yeah. And then, I mean, I mean, we can go through it. A lot yeah. of guys played well on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, yeah I think linebackers got, after this entire offseason of everybody kind of harping on who's going to step up at linebacker, who's going to step up at linebacker, I think Cody Fletcher and Daniel Green played by far the best games of their career. Daniel Green was everywhere Mm -hmm. it felt like if he wasn't making the tackle he was like right next to the ball carrier every single play yeah yeah i mean if there was one thing that you think you had to see for to hope kansas state's gonna have a really really good season was a really good daniel green you got that today um he was one of your mvps of course Mm -hmm. so you you had deuce daniel green tate and winkle you touch on special teams lightly here because there wasn't a whole lot of special teams to be had to just was an eventful day. Tate Winkle made his one field goal and then 
his three extra points. Yeah, three extra points. So he was perfect Brooks on the day. Far, but it was a hold that got him there anyway. So, yeah. So I yeah. mean, the defense was great. Joe, Cl- I thought Joe Klinerman called a great yeah. game too. The the, the uh-huh. sack for Cody Fletcher's sack was a great blitz call in that certain situation. I thought uh, there was another situation where I really like. Oh, the Russ East interception. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, you it's second and long at that point, so you're you're expecting to maybe they're going to go intermediate. At least that's what I was thinking to find a more manageable third down. So, And they sat on the Stanford intermediate passing game. Got it. I think it was a tip ball maybe, and Yeast put the pick. So I thought that was a really good call too. He was in the right zone. Yeah, Joe Klanerman did it. He, you know, he's on the sideline for the first time mm-hmm. as a defensive coordinator. He was in the booth all last year. Said he wanted to be on the sideline because he thought maybe he would go to his gut more than he did last year. Thought he got yeah. a little too analytical in 2020. Well, I think his gut paid off a couple of different times. Uh, on Saturday against Stanford because he made some really good calls. I thought it was one of the better games he's called as a defensive coordinator. I think we'll wrap this up yep. with yep. one with doing one more thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll, we'll come out with our top player at most of these positions yeah. and see if we're in agreement. If we're not, if we're not in agreement, that's fine. I think it'll be good debate at wide receiver. I kind of you know alluded to it. I think the best one was Philip Brooks today. He was open by far more than anyone else. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Brooks led the team in targets. He had a couple of nice catches. That, I mean, it was probably him or maybe no matter Bebe, I guess. But like, I yeah, I go I go Philip Brooks for sure because that was a huge play to set things up to when he got open and found space in the pocket for his probably biggest uh, pass catch of the day. And then, uh, you know, Malik did well on the ground, but wasn't you know super effective through the air. And then um, and then no matter Bebe, yeah, he had that drop and. Um, had one nice catch. I think Phillip Brooks is for sure the pass catcher of the game. Yeah, Deuce Vaughn, probably the best running back for sure. Uh, the ball carrier, offensive line, probably tough to really make a snap judgment. You have to watch the tape to kind of get away with a with a top lineman. Uh, probably uh, Cooper, but yeah. Yeah, but Cooper BB. Had a, you would think Cooper BB. Had, Josh Revis did have yeah, a yeah. did have a uh, one of the critical blocks on Deuce Vaughn's touchdown on third and thirteen. Should we talk also about? I mean, yeah, this is all good stuff, but we should also talk about Duffy's struggles in the second half. Yeah, yeah Duffy yeah. Duffy struggled a right tackle, but yeah, Josh Revis and Noah Johnson did have the critical block mm-hmm. um, yep. on Deuce Vaughn's rushing touchdown to make it fourteen to zero in the second quarter. Um, and that, I mean, other than that, you probably have to watch the tape before you make it really any snap judgments. Landry Weber had a block on that play as well, and that's one of his bright spots. Defensively, best defense alignment. So that's that'll be an interesting thing. They played a lot of guys. Michael Huggins with that big the, sack in the second half. I yeah, mean, I, I would know. say there's two to come to mind for me. It would be Eli Huggins and Khalid Duke. Because yeah. I thought Khalid Duke, Both. after tailing off a little bit last season, I thought he had a good day as well. Yeah, I'll go with Huggins because I think Huggins' sack was bigger than the Khalid Duke sack mm-hmm. because they were driving, and I think it was like second and six or so at like the 25 yard line and then Huggins made a play coming right up the middle and then that set up the Khalid Duke the Khalid Duke sack. That's how good this defensive line is though cuz we thought it'd be like a Timmy Horn and, and a DK possibly. I mean Timmy Horn took a lot of offensive line yep. for a ride today. Uh, he, that helps, it, it, it that probably helps everything probably didn't today. show up, probably won't show up on a stat sheet but he took those offensive linemen on the interior for a ride often. Didn't didn't seem like he played a ton. I mean, like it would be interesting to go back and see his, what his snap count looks like mm. uh, but I Eli Huggins' sack was probably more critical in terms of the timing. Khalid Dukes was probably right more, after that. Khalid, Khalid Dukes was yeah. probably more impressive in yep. the way that he pulled it off. I mean, that mm-hmm. was against the double team yeah. spin move. On uh, there's not many guys in college football that could they could pull that off, quite frankly. And mm-hmm. I didn't think he could, to be honest. So yeah. that was impressive. Linebacker, I think Daniel Green was by far the most impressive one, just because he was outstanding from start to finish. But Cody Fletcher was good. No doubt about that. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. were both really good, but Daniel Green mm-hmm. for me, just because he was around the ball so often today. I, yeah, I just, but Fletcher, yeah, he can't be understated as um, a player that needs to stay healthy, him and Green both. I mean, I, you know, we saw a little bit of Nick Allen here, but, it, but they rotated less at linebacker. Exactly. Daniel Green, Cody Fletcher played a, and they made, quite a bit. And they made that clear going into the season. Yeah. We've been saying this on KSO. You're going to see less rotation at linebacker than other players. Yeah, Daniel Green, Cody Fletcher played quite a bit in comparison to probably. Everyone, uh, every everywhere. every single starter everywhere yeah, besides sides quarterback the, and sides the offensive ball. line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> secondary. This one's interesting. I'd, I'd be curious. So I'll let you guys this go first. Uh, which defensive back you like the most? I know which one I did. Man, this one is tough. I mean, I go with. Uh, 
I could probably go with Gardner, honestly. I think Justin Gardner was put into a situation where we didn't even expect him to play as much as he did. I thought I expected Echo to play more. Gardner really got that second cornerback spot, I think, because he's the bigger guy and he probably is the more sure, surefire tackler. But I thought he played well. I mean, that's the thing. He wasn't thrown at a bunch from what I can remember. But also, the secondary did get help from poor quarterback play. But my answer is Justin Gardner. Uh, I'll go with Russ East because he was yeah. around the ball a lot. I think he was third or fourth on the team tackles and also had the interception that we talked about earlier where he mm-hmm. was in the right place. Smart. So I'll go with East. Russ East was my pick. I think it was pretty easy. I think TJ Smith would have been my second. I thought he was fairly well. He ran fast. He played played fast. I thought Russ East probably played the fastest, and that's saying something. Jerome McPherson did force a fumble or a pretty mm-hmm. good pop, too. Yeah. That probably needs mentioned. But I thought Russ East was definitely the best defensive back. And I can't, I can't really argue that. I honestly, he slipped my mind thinking of Gardner. And then I should, we should have let you guys go first so I could just copy your answer. No, I just want to make you look silly. <laughs> All right, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we'll have more thorough analysis of this game. Um, this was pretty instant reaction, you know, without a second look, without a third look. And I know is going to be talking to Chris Nelson, KSU Thanks, underscore man. fan, and they'll probably be able to provide some really good numbers that maybe back up what, some of what we said or maybe make us look like idiots. We'll find out. So, I'm excited. for Grand Flanders and his Justin Gardner fandom, Andrew Galloway, <sighs> I'm a Rusky super fan. <laughs> You're listening to KSO show friends tell your friends tell them 